Welcome to the Crafting Character Podcast. Steve Carter here, and in association with my good friends at Food for the Hungry, Hope International University, and Preaching Today, I bring you a podcast to help you get better at the craft of preaching while always hoping and ensuring that your character leads the way. I don't know about you, but Easter's coming and it's coming fast. And you've probably delivered a lot of Easter messages over the years. And sometimes you just, as we enter into these holidays, you need a little spark. You need a little inspiration. You, uh, you've taught the resurrection and you need just some help to see it anew again with that fire, that, that, that newfound freshness. And that's why I love preaching today because it helps me. It helps me dive into a story and see it again, anew, afresh. So go to preachingtoday.com. You can click on the tab. They have a whole section for holidays. And sometimes I just go there. They, they've got an article right now by Scott M. Gibson on Easter essentials or finding your story in the Easter story. And this is, this is where myself and Mark Moore, we walk through some pastoral insights, historical background, and geographical tips for preaching during Holy Week. And, and I'll just tell you, there's even articles and opportunities for sermon illustrations. Again, just to offer up a maybe some spark as you dive in and prepare in this Easter run. Well, today I'm excited because um, one of my friends, uh, someone I've known for the last few years, um, who actually we connected on this podcast, I interviewed Andy Colbert around her book, Try Softer. And I'm not sure um, if there has been more specific feedback about bringing a guest back than Andy Colbert. You all um, loved her. She she just had written um, this masterpiece called Try Softer and really um, has out, outdone herself um, because on Tuesday, March 21st, her next book comes out and it's it's so special. I mean, it is so special. <laughs> I've just been calling it the book of the year, the book of the year, because when I read it, um, the galley copy, it, 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 it ministered to me, it pastor, it gave me language, it helped me understand what so many of my friends and family and congregates and staff are going through. And honestly, just put language to stuff that has been swirling within me. And so without further ado, can we welcome the one, the only, Andy Colbert. Andy Colbert, it is so good to be with you. You're one of my favorite people on the planet. Uh, every time I find myself leaving, whether a conversation or your presence, um, I feel like there's always good work to be done. Um, you are one of the few people while I was interviewing on this podcast before that I had to stop the interview and just grab my phone and Venmo you because I was like, you are, you are, um, you are actually giving me such truth and wisdom that isn't just for everyone um, for free. It is like for my own soul. And so um, I just, I just respect you. I, you. You know this, I told you this, I read the galley copy of Strong Like Water. I, I have referred to it as the book of the year. I, I have, I have declared it for 2023, the book of the year. And so thanks for joining us on the Crafting Character Podcast. Mm, absolutely. What an introduction. It's such a joy to be with you, my friend. I, I just treasure this time that we get to have together. Let me be your hype person. Let me just be the person who comes out before you speak. I, again, you, um, the, the way that you write, and, and what's amazing is you're not a theorist. You're not just writing about theories of how to live. You are someone who, um, has embodied this. Uh, you have worked through the pain, um, not avoided it. Um, and, and you've just taught me so much about this. I want to, I want to talk just first off is your first book, which I absolutely adored and loved, uh, try softer and now strong like water. Talk about how they are different and yet how they build on each other. Mm, yes, I know. It's, it's kind of, um, like I have laughed to myself a few times at just like the irony of, you know, here's this book that's about softness 
And then my next book is about strength, you know, and that there's a sense in which if you only look at that face value, it can feel like, wait, what happened to your message? You know, Um, but I think what I would just say is that it's almost like I have come to believe that the practices of Trisofter, that the compassionate attention that is really the heart of Trisofter, it's like it cannot help but birth a type of strength. Yes. And really, I think that in terms of how they're the same, I would say like, it's like strong like water is the natural movement from Trisofter because it's like with Trisofter, it in and of itself is a beautiful thing, you know, in a world that requires people to disconnect from their humanity, to leave themselves, to push harder, to, to just do all these things. Um, Trisofter is this very countercultural message. And I think that there's this bigger invitation. And the bigger invitation in a way is almost like what I think I'm addressing in Strong Like Water. And it's that we are invited to fully live. And that includes our softness. That includes compassion. But I really believe it's like it also births in us a way that is possible to show up um, to this present moment in the world, right? A time in which we have some really big problems to solve. We have people who have profound pain. We have intense polarization and anger and hate. And so there's a sense in which it's not that now all of a sudden we abandon Trisofter. It's that we learn to move with it so that we can harness not only our softness, but also the fierceness that God has given to us. Like there is, there is a um, God given fullness in all of us. And so how I would say these books are different is that in this book, there is, I would say much more of an emphasis on how do we harness the fullness so we can really truly show up. Uh, so good. When I, when I think of the the Tri Softer title, I mean that that phrase. Um, you know, I I found myself saying it because as someone who had grown up, try harder. You know, just just prove yourself, just just perform, just go go go. And and part of it, you know, both you and I played hoops like basketball. You know, like we we know how to show up for a game, and you feel that pressure. And there was a mantra of that try softer that allowed me to connect with my body. It, it, it changed even the way that I would show up on a stage to preach or to teach. But then you've got this new title, Strong Like Water. And I remember when the first time I, I was driving in Arizona and you're like, here's the title for the book. And I was like, ooh, I like that. What does it mean? <laughs> like, tell me, tell me about it. You're like, we're try softer. You're like, Ooh, I get that right away. Mm-hmm. But then as you broke down the title, I was like, Oh my goodness. Now that phrase mm-hmm. in itself, I'm like, that, that is a message for so many of us who have work and are doing work to mm-hmm. really harness. I love how you use that word harness to harness that good. Talk about the title and where that came from. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So strong like water. I, um, I love this title. I love it so much. And I think it's because a lot, there's lots of reasons. Part of it is that I think from my whole life, I'm, I'm 39 years old right now. Um, my entire life, I've had this ambivalent relationship with my own strength. Wow. I grew up really being seen as, as very strong. Um, you know, in just about any setting, I ended up being a leader, a captain, um, a a high achiever, a person that people rarely thought Andy needs help. Mm. Like it, I think it was very rare for people to look at me and say, gosh, she seems vulnerable to something, you know, to pain, to hard. And and for folks who might be familiar with my story, I, you know, I'm a survivor of complex trauma. Um, and there's a lot to that. There's a lot to that that I'm not going to go into right now. But what I will say is that I learned to cope with the profound just dysfunction and 
um, abuse and trauma in my home by, in like Trisopter, I talk about it like white knuckling. Yep. I learned to push, push past. I learned to, I developed parts of myself that were like, um, like armor, very, like very outwardly. And, and I would say, according to many definitions of strength, very strong. And so there's a sense in which those did their job. Those parts of me did their job to help me survive a profoundly challenging childhood. Um, and so, but as I grew, it's like that ambivalence with the strength was that there was a sense in which it was like for my own internal story has been like, well, but what about me? Yeah. <laughs> like, why was I never, why did I get the support? Why did it feel like other people didn't see how badly I was hurting? Because I, I really was. And my trauma responses were so formidable that people didn't even know to the extent. And, and I think if you get under the surface and stuff, I'm sure like now with what we know, people could have put figured more out. But I wasn't the kid that people would be like, ooh, we're really worried about her. And that always created this sense in me, this angst, like gratitude that I could figure out how to navigate and also anger. Yeah. Like I shouldn't have had to be so strong. Why did I have to be so impressed? Like, and I know that sounds bad. I don't mean to say like I was so impressive, but it was like, it was like that was the only choice is what it felt like. It felt like I did it because I had no choice. Yeah. And so for me, the strong like water title is a reclaiming of strength. It is, it is birthed from my work of Try Softer. And in a way, it's a book I've been writing my whole life to figure out what is, how do I honor this profound fire that lives in me? The profound fire that desires to live and survive. But how do I do that in a way that doesn't harm me? Because that's what I found is that I didn't know how to connect to the parts of myself that were so fierce without it feeling like it burnt me up too. And so Strong Like Water is the work of learning to honor really all of it. Yeah. I mean, honoring the survival, honoring how I learned to survive, but then also the work of allowing there to be an alchemy, a transformation into like, like everything that I've learned, I get to bring with me, but I don't have to do it from a place of survival anymore. Yeah. That's so good. You, you have a phrase in the book that you come back to again and again. And um, I, I remember reading through it and I was, um, I, I was going to uh, Montana to, to fly fish. And I was standing by this, this bank and, and the water was just like rushing. There was this mm -hmm. flow of water. And I kept like thinking of this title, you know, strong like water to kind of see. And this phrase that you use often in the book, the flow of strength. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think right now where for many of us, you know, in the church space, in leadership spaces, you're watching whether, um, we don't necessarily to know what to do with that fierceness, um, because we've seen that strength and that power be abused. But the way that you talk about the flow of strength really reminded me, oh man, there, there is a better way. Talk mm -hmm. about that phrase flow of strength and, and why that is so important for pastors to embody, for humans to embody, for the people in our church to embody. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, well, so the flow of strength is this term that I coined that is really sort of an explanation for what I would call these different kinds of strength. And, and really, you know, earlier you asked me about this and I didn't really answer it, but really when I think about strong like water, I think of a more expansive definition of strength. And, and the flow of strength is key to that because what we're doing is we're putting words and sort of definitions to how all the different types of strength, what they are, how they look, why we need them, and that they all have value. And so with the flow of strength, I start on one side with what I call situational strength. 
And situational strength, you can really think of it essentially like like survival strength. It is the kind of strength that, you know, for folks who are aware of things like the window of tolerance, it's like when we go outside of our window, we are in situational strength. Um, and so it's when our body or brain are per- is perceiving that there's such significant danger that we have to go into survival mode. We have to go, you know, either into our sympathetic nervous system or, you know, that's typically like fight or flight or potentially fawn. Um, and it could also look like going down into like a dissociation or dorsal vagal type of response. Those are all, if you think about it from our survival brain, essentially. So it was important to me to really honor situational strength. Like we need situational strength. The goal of this work is not to get rid of it. It is to, first of all, acknowledge why we need it, which again, when we are in life and death situations, including ongoing abusive situations or traumatic situations, our body is going to appropriately respond from situational strength. Um, However, what can happen for a lot of us, especially folks who've had a history of unresolved trauma, um, is we get stuck in situational strength. So it's like our body naturally has the mechanism to essentially move the energy that comes up with situational strength, almost like a meal that you eat. Our body is designed to metabolize that energy, move it all the way through, and then we come back to our full self. But with situational strength, it's like, it's like it's completely stuck. And so that energy doesn't get metabolized. It's like it just exists in your body. And every time something reminds you of the thing that was originally dangerous, you're right back there, like the meal that just never will digest. So the work is in it. The thing I talk about in the book is that on the flow of strength, the next place we move, as our body perceives that we have some safety and support is that we will move towards something that I call transitional strength. And with transitional strength, it's kind of like, um, it's, it's like I, I talk about it in the book, like you have one foot in your window of tolerance and you have one foot potentially outside of it. So it's sort of like you might, you, you know, you could probably notice like, oh, I am an aware that my heart is beating really fast. Or like, I am aware that this person makes me feel really uncomfortable. And I'm noticing that. Anything that helps us and allows us to be able to observe it is kind of a cue that we are kind of in a place where we can, the transitional strength is like a both and place. The energy is still there, but once we can observe it, we can actually work with it. We can, we can maybe give our, help ourselves access resources. We can, you know, become more regulated. We can help soothe ourselves. Like we can reach out for help. Um, and so this transitional strength place is really important. And in a way, that's where a lot of trisofter took place is all about that transitional strength. It's the compassionate attention, um, is very much in that realm. As we do that work, as our body perceives that it has what it needs to move it through, to digest it, we will move towards integrated strength. And that integrated strength is really what it feels like when it, when it, there's a sense that it's come to completion. Like, like, it's not like you're like, oh man, this hurts really bad and I can be aware of it. It's more like, okay, something about that feels over now. I don't have that activation in my body in that same way. It may even feel like I can tell that's in the past because it doesn't feel so present to us. And I think one thing that's really important to understand about this whole flow is that for some of us, like for survivors of trauma, you might go through the flow of strength multiple times a day. Or you might even spend a lot of your time mostly in transitional strength. Um, There is... It's going to depend a lot on the person, their story, their history, their resources. And there's no bad. It's nothing about this is bad. It's about our body having what it needs so it can move it through. Yeah. And and I love that where you talk about that situational, the transitional to the integrated. I mean, I'm telling you, friends, this is you you just get that section it's worth the price of the book because it was so helpful to see oh this is what's happening right now 
And for many of us as preachers and pastors, we're constantly living in this situational and transitional. And we all have this longing, deep, deep longing to live from an integrated place, but so much is coming at us and it's really, really hard. And this is why this book has been such a gift for me personally is because there were a couple of phrases that you you use. You talk about the key elements and aspects of flexibility and adaptability to to really move through that. Talk about that. And then I want to I want to get like really, really practical because with you, Andy, as someone who who does speak, who is, you know, um, you, you have clients, you, you you are with people, you you, you are, you know, a, a mom, a, a wife, like you, you, you like you live with people, like you, you have this sense of belonging, how, how that plays out in your life when you are like functioning in the situational in one moment, a transitional one moment, and how you have experienced that flexibility, adaptability to, to move into that integrated more often than not. So, so yeah, talk about flexibility, adaptability first. Yeah. Yeah. No, this is such a key element. And really when I think about water, that's one of the things, I mean, obviously water, you know, can change different states, but that's part of what makes water so special, right? Is that it can adapt and change. And I think that's something that's so beautiful about who we are as humans, that God really endowed us with this ability to adapt. We can adapt to threat and we adapt to safety and we adapt to goodness. Like, for all the ways, for all the ruptures, that's not the end of the story. Like there is the hope always, always, always there's the hope of repair. And that every, I think of safety, which is really when I connect to that, I, that concept of compassionate resourcing is another way to say say, things like safety. But so when we talk about flexibility, adaptability, one of the key elements here is that For folks who have a history of unresolved trauma, and and maybe someone who's listening, maybe you wouldn't even, I want to just say, you may not identify yourself as someone who has a history of unresolved trauma. However, this is why it's helpful for us to have such an expanded understanding of trauma. Because when if you are a person who noticed a lot of stuckness in your life, if there is a lot of sense of like, um, there's this these issues that just, they don't feel like I can ever quite resolve them. There are potentially relational issues that continue to come up. There are, there are these ways in which I feel disconnected from my body. I want to encourage you to get curious about that. I'm not, I, I cannot say with certainty um, that that is trauma, but I think it's something where it's like, it's indicative of something in our body. There's a rigidity there. And that tends to be about something that has not fully resolved itself. And so if you can approach it from that lens, it's something to just be aware of, because that is another way we can think of trauma. When something is so overwhelming to our body and nervous system, we lose the flexibility to move along that flow of strength. So the opposite of that then is that as we heal, as we have what we need to uh, compassionately resource, our body gains more flexibility again. Like Like an athlete, right, who has all these injuries. It's like as you go through PT and do the work and do the stretching and do the things that you need, your body regains the ability to like some agility there. And there is a sense in which that is our goal here too. The goal is that we would have what we need so our nervous system can accurately assess what's in front of us. I think that's so genius on so so many levels because I think I think for again so many pastors you I want you to hear this. You might not be thinking, oh, I have unresolved trauma. But one of the things I respect so much about Andi, and she's an amazing follow on Instagram, is the way that she communicates, the tone at which she communicates. You read her posts, you read her writing, and whether someone's in a situational space, someone's in a transitional space, you're, that curiosity that you write is really inviting people into an integrated space. And it's amazing sometimes when we're not kind of aware of what's happening within us. 
what ends up happening is our tone at which we communicate, you know, and we're, we might be speaking truth. We might be speaking like, oh, how much God loves people. But the way at which we're saying it, it's sending people into a situational space. It, it's sending people into having them leave that integrated. Uh, and and I, I'm just curious, like when you write and when you speak, you're always constantly reframing, like even just your, you know, compassionate resourcing. You talk about flexibility, that, the integrate, like all of these words at which you write, it feels so invitational. Mm-hmm. Talk about that because again, for someone who's done so much hard work, I know you, like our, our families know each other, like this, you, you're as real as it gets. Um, you know all this stuff. I mean, you're dropping dorsal fins and different knowledge, you know, <laughs> you're dropping, you're dropping all this 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 practical knowledge brain science all of that but there's also this ability not to white knuckle it like there's this this ability at which you're speaking with strength but that strength is so compelling it's so mm-hmm. inspiring just can you just help us understand just even your ability with how you write and your tone because there's something about that for me that's always um yeah, just so moving. Cause you could be like, duh, you're, you're, you're dumb for going to that. Like, you know, like all of it. It's never that. It's just mm-hmm. this sense of working through it, respecting what's happening in the body and trusting that process. Talk a little yeah. bit about that tone piece. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, that means the world to me and it means the world that it comes through. Um, and I, I think, I think one of the big things for me, is this place of, I really believe that our bodies are designed to essentially do the best they can. And what I mean by that is, uh, and, and this is not to say that we don't have responsibility for our choices. This is not to say that we get to cause harm to people because we're like having a hard day, right? Like we need to make sure that that always is held in tension. But I think especially as a trauma survivor myself, I have just such profound compassion for how missed I have felt in my own life. Like where it's like, I think even when it feels like people have the best of intentions, I'm like, oh, but that's not it. <laughs> like, like, like the intention is good, right? But, but like it could not hold a candle to the actual pain or the problem. The good intention did not solve the problem. It did not heal the pain. It could not move the trauma through. And so after 15 years for me of doing the job that I do, it has taken a lot of curiosity, a lot of self-work, a lot of additional training to learn about like, well, why is this so hard? <laughs> like, why in the world could people, uh, you know, speaking specifically about someone, for example, like a trauma survivor, how could someone have so much information and be highly intelligent and highly resourced in one area of their life and it will not change the thing they're struggling with. I mean, those are the kinds of things that made me just be like, like, we got to find a different way, you know? Cause I think it was about seven years um, for me into doing, being a therapist. And I was like, this is not enough. Talk therapy is not getting us where we need to go. And so, you know, with that, that piece, that tone for me, part of it comes from this respect it is a respect, you know, I think from, from my faith, it's rooted in the belief that each person carries the image of God in them and that I honor that, that, that always, like if I'm speaking to someone, I need to do all that I can to remember before anything else, before I look at their attempts or their non-attempts or anything else, that's who they are and they are deserving of respect And they may, you know, and it doesn't mean that there's not hard interpersonal things or whatever, but that's like, that's a first and foremost, right? And I believe 
that, that God placed a wisdom in every single person's body. And so my job is not to give you the wisdom. My job is to help people tap into the wisdom that already exists. And so when you hear that invitation, it really is an invitation because I trust, I trust that there is something in you and in me and in each of us that longs, that aches, that knows, has that far off memory of Eden, right? And is like longing for that. And if we can help people get, if we can get around them, if we can love them, if we can compassionately resource them, if we can empower them to listen, that they will know, they will have a sense of where we're going. Yeah. You, you know, it's amazing is, you know, you've, you've riffed about this before, but Jesus, like his ministry as this model of nervous system flexibility, I, I, for me, I it just, again, what you invite people into and just what you just even articulated, I started going through the gospels and I just started thinking about Jesus sitting next to a Samaritan woman. I'm like, oh man, he, or, or just, you know, a whole bunch of people want to like stone a woman and they got rocks in their hand. And then and Jesus just invites them into some bigger, deeper question. He just constantly was doing this, but I've heard you riff about this. And I feel like it's like, just to all of the preachers, I want you to see again, the faith piece that Andy brings her understanding of the model of ministry that Jesus embodies. And this isn't just like, like new therapy. Like, no, no, this is actually at the core of how Jesus saw humanity. And when you see this and you get this, like it will change the way that you see your congregation as you preach or as you mm. meet with them. Talk, talk about that nervous mm. system flexibility. Again, another l- line that you reframe for me that I'm like, compassionate resourcing, oh, so helpful. Try so, so helpful. Shine like water, so helpful. Nervous system flexibility, new language. Explain that for me. Mm, yeah, yeah. Well, I love that you bring up Jesus because I think um, I love I love talking about and reflecting on the fullness of Jesus's humanity, you know, cause I think it is, I think this is something that people are talking about more, but I think it's really easy for folks to talk about Jesus's divinity and certainly that matters. Um, but I think for a long time, we have not really honored what it has meant that Jesus is fully human. And what that means for us, right? Like that these 33 years, right? And that he, and that he, the way that he was born and even the way that he died, like all of this, there is, there is significance, right? And that we're, it's not just transactional. It's not a transactional thing that Jesus came and lived. It wasn't like, oh, check the box, right? It was like, there is a fullness to his life. Um, I think for me, one of the stories that just gets me again and again is always Jesus weeping at Lazarus's tomb. I mean, there is something about the way that story is told in the sense that, and I know everyone listening already knows this story, but I just, the way that Jesus is moved the way that he weeps with his friends over this loss. But I know that Jesus knew he was about to perform a miracle. And even still, he goes there, right? He goes, he like really goes there. He is moved by the pain and the suffering. And so it's like, I mean, we have so many examples of nervous system flexibility within Jesus's life. I mean, anything that he does is about, his nervous. Like he's always bringing that with him. But I think about that, this particular story around the grief and the, and the, the withness that he provides in that moment. And I think about how easy it is, especially, you know, like if you're in a position of a leadership position, if you're, you know, that you hear about so much pain and there's so many things that can happen. Um, 
But there is this picture that we're given in Jesus of that the that the that the grief was not bad, that the grief was sacred too, even while it wouldn't be long. It wouldn't even be long until there was about to be a miracle. And I and I think about that like for all of us, this invitation where um to see that the God of the universe fully embody his own humanity. I think if anything, I'm like, may that be an invitation to fully embody your own, that it is not a liability. It is not a liability to honor the fullness of your emotional spectrum. And certainly, right, like we want to keep in mind things like the window of tolerance and those things, but the emotions themselves are vital information about ourselves and about the people that you care about. And learning to listen to that, I think is just really a gift. Um, And so, yeah, I love, I love the way that you bring that up and, and remind us that that's our work too. Well, and what's so great is again, the language that you gave me in strong like water is now I'm reading through the gospels and I'm looking at Jesus in that moment, just similar to what you just described. I'm like, wow, look at the integrated strength right there. The, Mm -hmm. the, the ability to weep and not just skip over that emotion and that grief. Or, you know, you take another story where he looks over the city of Jerusalem and he Mm -hmm. weeps as, cause he sees the the sheep have no shepherd. And there's this Mm -hmm. sense of integrated strength to even go do the next best, harder, right, you know, and offer up his life. Like there, there, there are these pieces that I see now that I'm going, gosh, wow. Like this is, this is Jesus fully human living from a place of integrated strength in the whole spectrum of emotion. Um, I, I, there's a couple more pieces I, I, I felt like from the book that just absolutely, um, we're so moving. You, you talked a little about compassionate resourcing. There's there's a bunch there in the book, and that is a, a phrase that you talk about that I think, again, another one of those pieces that are <clears throat> will change the way that you uh will teach. I like it when I started to think about, man, is this is this challenge or or, or mm-hmm. invitation out of a message? Is this gonna be a tool for compassionate resourcing? Or is it gonna be like uh, oh, another, this is what you should do or, or a pressure like that, that compassionate resourcing piece was just unbelievable. But you, you talk about one thing that I I just, I have to ask you about because it, it's, um, in a world that is all about authenticity right now, you, you talk about the power of belonging, talk about, Mm -hmm. um, not not that authenticity is bad, but talk about the 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 need though for belonging and why that's mm. so important in that spectrum of authentic authenticity and belonging. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a great quote that um, I refer to in the book by Dr. Gabor Mate, and it's it talks about um, that people have two needs: attachment and authenticity. Um, and when attachment threatens authenticity, that we will choose attachment over authenticity. It, and so what he's saying there, and I, I didn't say that exactly accurately, but that's the sense of the quote. What he's saying there is that both of those needs are important. Attachment, authenticity. What he means by attachment is essentially belonging, that we need to belong. We need to feel connected. And so when we, those two needs both matter. But when we have to choose, we will always choose belonging. But we shouldn't have to choose because when we have to choose that way, that authenticity, like that in many ways is the basis for a lot of trauma. That there's a sense in which, you know, in in trauma language and in in the spaces some I sometimes am in, there's this language of sometimes like like le- people will say like you're leaving yourself or you are um sometimes people say abandoning yourself. I I don't personally love the language of abandoning yourself, but there's a sense in which you're having to disconnect from yourself in order to belong. That's the essential idea. And and in a short-term survival strategy, that actually is 
sometimes necessary. Like when you're a kid and you are completely relying on your family of origin to take care of you and you trying to be who you really are, like might mean that you'll be ostracized or like shamed or so kids and they wouldn't, they wouldn't name it this way, but they find ingenious ways to survive because our bodies are adaptable and we, and we do what we'd have to do. Oftentimes those kiddos, and maybe it, it's not just a family, maybe it's a system, maybe it's, there's lots of different mechanisms of belonging, um, that at some point there will be a re, there will be a rumble. There will be something where it's like, okay, like this is not going to, this isn't working for me anymore because our body experiences that as trauma. Because when we have to literally stop listening to our internal sense of self, it's like you're losing the controls to your own car. And if you have to do that for your entire life, I mean, there's just so many things about that that are are potentially harmful. I mean, it sets you up to potentially be further traumatized. Um, It shrinks your window of tolerance because you don't know how to be with your emotions. It in and of itself um, is a type of trauma because you feel isolated and alone and not able to attune to your own body. Um, and so this, this whole, all of this, right? For so many people, a lot of this work is like a returning home. And there is a sense in which as we feel like we have the support and the resources that we turn towards ourselves again. And we look to say, to, you know, for me, maybe it's my younger self to say, I am so sorry that you had to disconnect, that I, that I, le- that I left the truth of who I am. And I know how much that hurt, you know, and to begin to listen to that younger part of ourselves. Sometimes there's multiple <laughs> elements of that. And to say, you know, what is it that you didn't, you know, like, What parts of your art or your creativity or your friendships or your, you know, so many things, the bigness, the fullness, what, what did you have to leave behind? And how can we come back to that in a way that when we think about it through the lens of Jesus, that is that it's like that fullness, right? I came that they might have life and have it to the full right? It's not an invitation to less. It is in fact an invitation to more. Gosh, that's so good. Um, man, that's, that, that hits on so many levels, um, just personally. And I think, I think, you know, when you start talking about how we, for many of us who, um, had to adapt to, to find that attachment or to find that belonging, you know, and, and you, you get to that point where you're like, oh man, that moment of just looking at that younger self and saying, I'm, I'm so sorry. Like I didn't honor that truth or I, or I, yeah, I didn't feel safe enough. There's, there's a sense of yeah. like compassion for it, but there's a sense of like grief for it. That's right. I want to, I want to ask you like a, just a, as someone who's inside the church and outside the church, you know, I'm, I'm in back in Chicagoland and I, um, I, I think I underestimated, um, the, the pain in this region with like church hurt. And there's like five or six churches right now that this is like affecting, you know, Mm -hmm. like a, a 30 mile radius of like, you know, over 2 million people. Like it just, it, it's, it's messed with trust and, and you could look at anywhere across the country. And I, I've been sitting with, um, you know, a core team at, at the church and, you know, and, and little decisions that probably wouldn't have, you know, five years ago, uh, triggered or created some sense of, uh, you know, just, just a struggle of like, where am I? Kind of like they, they find themselves in that transitional like strength. Like they're just trying to figure out like what's happening here. The trust issues are being kind of, um, and it's, it's, it's forced me to slow down 
to a level that like I'm not used to and to see in a lot of ways. And this is why Strong Light Water has been such a help for me because there's moments where I'm like, oh, this is, this is like new territory for me. I, I'm curious because for many of us who preach on the regular, for just some people walking into the church, it's forcing them into a place of struggle and internal uh, suffering. Like it just, mm. and, but they're, they're like, they're there. Um, mm. And then there's, there's, there's people that are like sitting in and, and they're still like, they want to give Christ a shot, but the, the church stuff is just uh, decisions and choices that, uh, that are, that are just messing with them. How do we, or any insight, wisdom <laughs> of how we can invite people back to acknowledge the place? Because I think for some people, they, they left themselves um, to do what their pastor told them. That's right. Mm -hmm. And now they're like, something happened and I, I, it, it, it's just, it, it's almost like you don't know if your, your, your personal discernment leveled up or got absolutely leveled. Mm -hmm. And there's, and so I feel like I'm watching people try to go, can I trust myself again? Cause something doesn't feel right, but I want it to be right. But I don't know if it feels right. And it's, it, I, Again, that's a, this is a very ambiguous question, but just any insight, like as, again, for people as we pastor in a season where there has been church hurt to help people integrate back to themselves and attach in a healthy way yeah. to the church. Any insight mm -hmm. to that? Yeah. Well, I just love your heart and I just love that you're even aware and even that you would be willing. I think for me as a trauma therapist, the fact that you're even recognizing the connections here is, is really hopeful to me because I think that unfortunately there are a lot of portions of the church that would not even understand how these things might be connected. Um, so with that said, I think, you know, for folks who are in roles of pastoring, I think one of the things, you know, some of this is going to feel basic, but if you'll allow me to, to help you understand why it matters so much, I think one of the things to understand is when someone has been harmed and there isn't um, a resolve, um, their body, rightly so, is extra sensitive to anything that feels like it could be in the same category of the harm that already happened. So this is just a very basic trauma reality that you should know. So if you are regularly interacting with people who likely have experienced uh, church hurt, um, you are, which is probably everywhere right now, like everywhere, you know, um, what you need to understand is that People's bodies, even if cognitively they understand maybe that you're safe or that you're doing your best, there are even things like phrases, phrases that um, maybe were used against them, uh, like certain verses. Uh, uh, it, it can be, and really I'm using this as an example because these there can look so many different ways, but it can even be like types of Bible translations. I mean, it can be, um, not giving someone enough information around why you want to meet with them. I mean, these can seem very innocuous, but if that is the place where they experience or like the mechanism that caused them harm, that is, it doesn't matter that it's completely from your side. Um, like no, there's no ill intentions or anything, you know? So I think, I, I think that's important to understand because I hope it, it just increases that compassion that their bodies are doing what it's supposed to do. Our bodies do that because they're like, oh, we've been through that before and we're not doing that again. 
Right. So our bodies do that. That is a God-given gift because our bodies are trying to keep us safe. Now, as we heal, our bodies um, return to, when I talk about accurately perceiving something, that is what I mean, is that our bodies return to a place of that person is actually safe and I experience them as safe. This situation is actually dangerous and I experience it as dangerous. That is an accurate perception. Now, a lot of people's bodies is going, they're potentially, um, more, they're going to be a little bit off if they've, if they're carrying additional harm. So that's one of the first things that I just would encourage folks to be aware of. I think another thing that I would just say is that, and you kind of referred to this when you talked about my language, but the more invitational cho- like language you can use, the more choices you can give people. So like, for example, when I, um, like on my, let's say my Instagram, um, you know, I, I somewhat frequently will just share little, little resources, little things. Like it could be a breath prayer. It could be like a small meditation. It could, it just, they're very brief, but when I share them, I always, and especially the last year, this is something that I've I've tried to become even more consistent in doing, but to say, if it feels like a resource to you, Mm. I invite you to do this, you know, and, or maybe I change the language a little, but essentially it's saying what I'm doing a couple of things. First, I'm inviting you to check in to see if it even feels like a resource because I trust that God gave you wisdom. And I trust that, that God is working in you. So I'm, an, I'm, I'm inviting you to assess that first. Second, I'm trying, I am saying, then I invite you. Not I force you. Not if you, do, if you don't do this, you're bad. Not if you don't do this, you're a sinner. Not if you don't do this, you're like not trying hard enough. Like I invite you, right? So I'm not saying everyone who's listening needs to do it the exact same way. But just as a model to understand People who have experienced trauma, the core of trauma is that you don't have a choice. You literally feel as though it's not just that you feel, you are experiencing the reality that that you will just do what you have to do, whatever you have to do to survive. So even if that's telling a pastor, yes, when everything in you is like, no. Because you know, like that belonging might feel so necessary that it feels like if I say no, my entire life will fall apart. That's valid too. Like that is also life or death. When you feel like everything, like all the people that you love, your entire life is wrapped up into something. And unless you say yes, that you will be harmed or punished, that is also a traumatic dynamic right there. So, so I think, you know, uh, sometimes people think about this like in a very specific categories, but there's lots of things that are life or death that don't always from the outside, people don't always think of them that way. Yeah. Um, and so I, I would just say as much as possible to recognize that when you are giving directives, if you are able to give people things like choices to, um, to encourage them to check in with themselves, to encourage them to check in with the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit is guiding you, because I recognize that it may not be for everyone, you know, there's just this inherent recognition that there are millions of people in the world and we all have unique and dynamic makeups and that that should be honored. Mm. And so when we do that, we are honoring the inherent dignity that God has given each of us. And if there's any place in the entire world that should be really good at that, it should be the church. Wow. Friends, okay, just again, I'm going to start to Venmo Andy again because I'm telling you, Strong Like Water is going to give you language. It's going to give you insight. But just just like subversively, you're going to read and just hear her tone at how she can communicate such deep and rich and healthy and helpful language. It's, it's, I'm telling you, you will be a wiser and more emotionally attuned pastor. You have to get this book. Again, you've heard me say it. It's the book of 2023. It's a beautiful cover. Um, but the words in it will literally, um, 
help you, but it's actually going to help the way you pastor your people. If you love your people, um, I, I, I want to like should on people right now. If you love your people, you should read this book. That's not really great. I'm inviting you. I'm, pr- I'm practicing it right now. I'm yes, inviting yes. you. I'm inviting you because I believe in this book so much. I want mm-hmm. everyone to get it. Um, I'm inviting you, please uh, pick this up. You will, I promise you, you will thank me later because uh, this has uh, deeply, deeply helped me understand my people and how to love them well. Andy, where can people find you? Because um, whether on social media, whether online, because um, your work is so helpful. And we didn't even talk about the guided journals for Try Softer. People need to get that. I'm, t- I'm just, I'm your biggest fan. But like, seriously, where can people find you? Yes. Yes. Well, thank you so much. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Andy Colber. Um, you can find me on Instagram at Andy Colber and then on my website, andycolber.com. And, and there are some resources there, like some free videos and um, would love to have you join my email list. There's a, a couple of resources that come with that. So yeah, would love to have folks find me there. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the Craft and Character Podcast. And I'm so excited for Strong Like Water. It's uh, it's really, really hard for a lot of people to follow up with book number two. And again, this just feels like um, the next step in integrated strength. And I feel so excited for um, this release and what it's going to mean for so many. So grateful for you, my friend. Many, many blessings to you. Thank you, my friend. Well, thanks so much for tuning into the Crafting Character Podcast again. If you need help this Easter run, check out preachingtoday.com. They're going to help you. They're going to help you. They help me. I want them to help you. Help your messages get stronger and stronger so that you can continue as new people, uh, people who have drifted, people who are just showing up with their family can be surprised by the hope that Easter and the resurrection brings. Remember, we are Easter people living in a Good Friday world. And so many blessings to you as you all prep prepare and get ready for an incredible holy week. Grace and peace, everyone. We'll see you soon on the Craft and Character Podcast. Mm-hmm.